Welcome back. I'm Melissa Harris-Perry. This is a new report. It's a big one. It was released just this week from the American Civil Liberties Union, and it unequivocally lays bare the truth about our national drug policy. And the truth of that policy is this. It's biased. It's broken, and it is costing us billions. The ACLU's analysis took an in-depth look at the enforcement of marijuana possession laws, and here's what they found. When it comes to marijuana, use rates among black and white Americans are nearly equal. In fact, in every year from 2001 to 2010, more white folks than black folks between the ages of 18 and 25 reported using marijuana in the previous year. But when the ACLU looked at who our justice system condemns to criminality because of that use, the analysis found a vast inequality. Black people are nearly four times more likely to be arrested than white people who light up at the same rates. And between 2001 and 2010, most of these arrests, 88 percent of them, were for simple possession. Not people like the suburban mom charged with running this $3 million pot operation. No! The vast majority of people whose lives become ensnared in the criminal justice system after a marijuana arrest were found with just enough for personal use. Those cases where someone was busted for simple possession account for nearly half of all drug arrests. The ACLU calculated one marijuana arrest every 37 seconds in 2010. That's every 37 seconds that you should imagine money flying out of your pocket because the price tag for enforcing the marijuana possession laws that enable those arrests is $3.6 billion of your taxpayer dollars. In exchange for your money, here's what you get from drug policy. A complete failure to decrease the availability or use of marijuana. And hundreds of thousands of people, disproportionately African American, whose lives are often irrevocably changed by entering the criminal justice system. Here with me now is Carl Hart, Associate Professor of Neuroscience and Psychology at Columbia University. He's also served on the National Advisory Council on Drug Abuse and is the author of High Price. Judge Billy Murphy, a criminal defense attorney and former circuit court judge for the city of Baltimore. John Nichols, Washington correspondent for the nation and author of Dollarocracy. And Michael Skolnick, editor-in-chief of GlobalGrind.com and political director for Russell Simmons. All right. Yeah. Is there anything in this that isn't just that we didn't already know? No, there's nothing Thank in you. it. There's nothing in it that we didn't know uh, if we were paying attention. Yep. But it is still very, very important. In a way, it's like the NSA stuff we were talking about mm -hmm. before. Uh, we know a lot of stuff, but to have it confirmed, to have the data, to have, yep. have it come out, and to force this conversation that we're having right here, it comes in context because there's something I happen to think of as very, very positive going on in this country. Across this country, people are voting to strike down these laws yep. against marijuana. Uh, we have you know, statewide referendums across this country, local mm -hmm. moves to decriminalize, even to legalize. And that is, that's so vital because the fact of the matter is everything this study shows us tells us that the only way that we're going to begin mm -hmm. to address this is with removing those laws. Yeah, you this, cannot change right, right, What this report ultimately comes down to is saying, look, you just simply have to legalize marijuana for 21 and above. You have to create certain kinds of rules around it, right, the same way that we have around alcohol. But you can't, you just can't expect an enforcement that isn't biased as long as it's illegal. Melissa, I, I don't know if we need to legalize hmm. marijuana. Okay. I mean, in my, as, as I uh, delineated in my book, I think the first thing we need to do is decriminalize it. And that's it. So decriminalization yeah. means that uh, it, it's no longer it's still illegal, mm -hmm. but people can't get a criminal record for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's the first step. And then the second step we need... Help, help people who are listening to understand the difference. Give me something in this world that is illegal but not criminalized. Okay, let's think about driving. Mm -hmm. When you have a driving infraction, instead of sending you to jail, you pay a civil fine. Yep. That's decriminalization. Yep. Okay. Uh, and and that's, what we're, that's what I argue for in mm -hmm. terms of marijuana yeah. and all drugs, in mm -hmm. fact. But in terms of the legalization, one of the things that concerns me is that that the country is like adolescents. They're infants when it comes to drug education. There are so many myths and misunderstandings that people will get in trouble if you mm -hmm. do have a widespread or wide availability. Mm -hmm. So criminals, criminalization for me is an intermediary step mm -hmm. in where we can have in the corresponding amount of education that goes along. Oh, and then if we want to reevaluate and think mm -hmm. about legalization, that's fine. Then that's possible. Now, yeah. what, why, why do you say uh, uh, all drugs should be decriminalized? Thank it's you. a very important No, that's a great point. Uh, I say that all drugs should be decriminalized because drugs are just like automobiles in, the fa in, in the, this simple fact. Just like automobiles, they are potentially dangerous, 
but we know how to minimize the harms associated with automobiles, we can right. do the same thing with drugs. But you, the American public, has been misled to believe that drugs are so dangerous that they cause these extreme brain changes. Simply not true. Not supported by the weight of the evidence. Is, is, it, is it not true that, that drugs... Um, uh, is it, are, you, are you making the claim that illicit or illegal drugs are simply not that different than those things that we get via prescription or over the mm -hmm. counter? Or are you saying that drugs really don't have that much of an impact on our brain chemistry? Because I'm just thinking, uh, you, you know, people who are going through everything from cancer treatment to infertility treatment recognize that when you put a substance in your body, it can make enormous physiological no, 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 difference. You, you make an excellent point. Yeah. Uh, when we think about a drug like methamphetamine, mm -hmm. for example, and do you know Adderall? Yeah. Adderall mm -hmm. is the attention yeah. deficit disorder mm -hmm. drug. Which we hand out to kids. That's right. And yeah. they are the same drug. I mean, my research shows this. Other people's research shows this. I, I talk about it in the book. They're the same drug. Mm -hmm. When we think of drugs like morphine, which we use for pain, mm -hmm. exact same drug as heroin. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or Oxycontin. Yeah. Or Oxycontin. The rest of these things. Now, that's not to say that people can't get in trouble with these sure. drugs. It's just simply to say that we know how to decrease harm and we know how to mm -hmm. use these things. But Carl, doesn't it also take us to the issue of self-medication? Okay. We have a lot of people who, who um, in, a, in a broken health care system, are looking for something to ease a pain. Uh, and we have a lot of our drug problems in this country are legal drugs. Mm -hmm. right? But, but if, if I could just, back to the ACLU report for a moment, if I could. The, the challenge is the ramifications of the racial bias of our yep. drug policy, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Stop and frisk here in New York. Right. We have more marijuana arrests under stop and frisk than gun arrests. Right, it turns out right? really it sucks for guns. Not so bad Not for marijuana. marijuana. And so here's what happens, right? A 13, 14 year old kid gets picked up for possession. Yep. He goes to jail for a night, just one night. Mm -hmm. He goes to jail and says, I, Judge, I could do this. Right. But I could do a night. And then the next weekend he gets picked up. He gets the weekend because the judge is not in on Friday. He got to wait till Monday. He does the weekend. I could do a weekend. And then I could do six months. I could do 18 months. I could do 36. I could do six years. I could do 55 years. I'm 65 years old and dying in jail. So it's conditioning young black and brown yep. young people right, of a life in prison. Well, let so me tell you how bad it is. Let me tell you how bad it is. On the streets, there is a saying, you're not a man unless you've done some time. Now, mm -hmm. you can't get any worse than that. Mm -hmm. My God, this is black men uh, 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 persuading other black men that a rite of passage is going to jail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. Well, but but that said, we've had we've had um, kids at, at the table here. We try to often bring in young people who have said to us that it is it's less that sort of pressure from other young African Americans and more not just the well I can do that, but the dehumanizing experience of walking down the street and finding yourself suddenly pushed against the wall, mm -hmm. yeah. having your mm -hmm. pockets turned out right, and that sense that. If you are a citizen of a country, if you are, if your mom is a taxpayer, if she's a school teacher and you're walking down the street, but your body becomes always assumed to be criminalized, the impact that that has, but not just, just not just sort of like emotionally, if, if you get these arrests, sometimes it means no more student loans. That's right. Sure. No more living in public housing, right? No more um, uh, opportunity for certain kinds, for many, in many places in the country, no more ability to vote, right? So right. we actually yeah. get shrink our electorate. Can we, uh, let's, let's talk about some of the assumptions related to mm -hmm. the yep. way we uh, legislate these drugs. One of the major assumptions is that drugs are so dangerous. Marijuana is so dangerous, so we have to go after it with all of this force. Because right, it's a gateway. It, it's a gateway, it's dangerous. Now, one of the things that I've learned in all of my years of research is that drug effects are predictable. Increase the dose, you can get some toxic effects. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I've learned from my research and also from living is that black men and black boys' interactions with the police are not predictable. Mm -hmm. That's why you got Ramarley Graham up in the Bronx, the kid who was killed because he yeah. thought he, they thought he had marijuana. That's why you had Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. George Zimmerman thought that he was under some influence of some drugs. That sort of belief, those assumptions are even more harmful when those kind of things happen. It, it, was, it was useful, uh, as, I was, uh, as I was reading the text, that part of what's going on here is you say that, um, that when we talk about drug use, it's not just an individual physiological experience, it's a collective experience. And you say one of the big myths of drugs is the idea that crack destroyed black communities, that crack is the thing that came in and destroyed urban communities. And I'm just thinking, Michael, you and I are around the same age, maybe you're a, a tad younger, but I, I mean, all of those films, right, sort of from that moment 
that said from New Jack City to Boys. I mean, it was all these Jungle films Fever, that say you know, the whole deal, the right? That, that crack was killing them. our communities. Yeah, I mean, it was just a you know a, a bombardment of media yeah. that you know black people and black people are bad and bad and bad and bad, and then we bought it. We yep. bought it. But yeah. we bought it hook line and yeah. we, we bought it. And not only that, we say it in hip hop. Even today, there are people yeah. who are still saying how awful crack cocaine is. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, and then on the other hand, they're lamenting the laws that punishes crack cocaine. Okay. Mm-hmm. They don't well, even and it's also such a convenient, it is such a convenient uh, target, such a convenient thing to talk about. Because what do we have in that parallel of that period? We have the deindustrialization of our urban areas. Mm-hmm. Yes. If you want to look at the Lock history job, of yes. the last 25 years, really, yeah. this period, you're going to see factory after factory after factory That's right. closing. That's right. And one of the fundamental realities is that you've taken areas where often people were invited to come from the south to the mm-hmm. more enlightened north, come and live in these neighborhoods, and then you have ripped the economic core out of them, yeah. right? And, you've le- and, and, and you say, well, it must be the drugs that are the problem. You know, as, soon, yeah. as soon as we come back, I want to talk about alternatives uh, to this. And, and because I, I just want to be really clear, parents, we are not encouraging you and your children to all, like, smoke crack together. That's not what's going on here. But we do want to bring down, tamp down the anxiety so that we can have a serious look at what actually needs to be done. What are the real problems when we come back?